Great. I'm happy to introduce Clay Cordova from UChicago. Clay has a broad range of interests, um, ranging from formal aspects of high energy theory and mathematical physics to condensed matter and particle phenomenology. Um, and today he'll be talking about anomalies of non invertible symmetries. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here and to present my work. Um, let me quickly uh, splash some references on the board. So this talk will be drawn primarily uh, from these papers. And I'd like to highlight uh, the key role of some junior people, uh, Po Shen Sin, who's not, I guess, quite junior anymore, and Carolyn Zhang, who's uh, luckily chairing my session. Um, so any questions can be deferred to the chair. Um, OK, so uh, I won't presume that uh, people in the audience are as steeped in the formalism of non-invertible symmetry as I am. So we have to go through a little bit of some examples. What are we talking about? What is the object of our study here? So the kind of standard way of characterizing a symmetry in quantum field theory is that we have some operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. And if we're uh, quantum field theorists, our modern view of this idea will be that we have some topological operator, O of sigma. That's what's going to encode a symmetry for us. So sigma here is some place where you put the operator. Could be any manifold in, in, in space time. And uh, this extends the idea of current conservation. If we had a, a conserved current, we could integrate it to make a, a charge. This charge would be a topological operator. Now typically, uh, in kind of standard examples that we learn about, such symmetries are represented by uh, unitary matrices with an invertible or group-like fusion rule. That's what I've written here. So you take two of these, these operators labeled by H and G, and you smash them together, and you get the one labeled by HG, where these are some group labels telling us what symmetry group we have. But in the last few years, uh, we've been studying a more general algebraic structure that's realized in many quantum field theories, where in particular, this fusion rule is more complicated. So you have a model which has topological operators. And when you fuse them together, you don't get a unique right-hand side. Instead, you get some sum with some coefficients. And in general, these kind of topological operators don't have an inverse. They're not represented by unitary operators acting on Hilbert space. And we call that non-invertible symmetry. So it's topological operators that don't act by unitary uh, transformations on Hilbert space. Now, uh, that's a neat idea, but, but actually the, uh, the key thing is that you can find examples of this in theories that you are already studying. Uh, so let me give you some, uh, some recipe for making some examples that will be the main things that we'll study today. So these are examples that arise via dualities. So typically when you have a duality in a quantum field theory that gives an identification between different couplings, or you could say different classical presentations of the same underlying quantum system. But in special cases, if the coupling is particular, you might have a self-duality. That's a fixed point under the identification. And when that happens, you get extra symmetry. The, the fixed point theory at the special coupling has extra symmetry. And often this symmetry is non-invertible. So here I've listed some examples. Uh, one example, which will play a role today, is a kramers wanye self-duality of the critical 1 plus 1D Ising model. Uh, another example is ZN lattice gauge theory in 3 plus 1 dimensions at special couplings. And there are other examples, but we'll focus mostly on those and some generalizations of them. OK, so let's try to give some more details. I highlighted these fusion rules, these, these composition rules for symmetries, as something special. Let's say what it looks like in some examples. So let's look at uh, 1 plus 1 DQFT. Uh, let's, we'll give this theory some name, some abstract name T for theory. And it has some abelian ordinary symmetry G. So this abelian ordinary symmetry is associated with some lines, some topological lines in our 1 plus 1D theory. If they act on space, they're operators. If we extend them in time, they make twisted sectors. So those are the ordinary uh, G charges. And now we could gauge uh, this theory. We could gauge this G symmetry. And that produces a new theory. You might call it the orbifold theory or the gauged theory. And this theory, uh, interestingly, also has a dual G symmetry. So uh, that's a kind of uh, interesting feature of uh, gauging finite 
symmetries, here I'm talking about a finite abelian symmetry, uh, is that you don't really destroy the symmetry. It pops out in a new form. So here, even though we gauged G, there will be twisted sectors that have the G symmetry again. Now, in general, we can just make two different theories this way, but let's focus on the special circumstance of being self-dual. So when this theory is equivalent to its gauged version. In that situation, we can construct a new symmetry. This is the, at the, at the self-dual theory, we have a special symmetry, which is a non-invertible uh, symmetry, who has an associated topological line operator, which I'll call D. D is for duality, or maybe Dirichlet. Uh, and it has universal fusion rules. So, uh, so what's the idea of constructing this D? So here's the picture. You have the, your theory T. We're trying to make this, this line here, D, this topological line. And on the other side, we put T mod G, this gauge theory. But this is, because of this self-duality, this is the same theory. So this is an interface between the one theory and itself because of self-duality. And so over here, we have these dynamical G gauge fields. You could think G is Zn for most of this discussion. And here, we're putting some Dirichlet boundary conditions for them. So what are the fusion rules? Well, uh, okay, the L's, these, these, uh, these lines that tell us about this abelian symmetry, they just have the standard group-like fusion rules. The other fusion rule is that there's a kind of absorptive property. So if you take a, a group-like line here and you smoosh it into this D, it just gets absorbed. And then the final kind of money equation is this one, that if you fuse D with another D, instead of, uh, uh, instead you get some kind of sum, a coherent sum, over all of the group elements. Um, so this is, this is an interesting universal fusion algebra, and it occurs in practice in uh, some interesting uh, 1 plus 1 deconformal field theories. So one example with G equals Z2 is the critical Ising model. Uh, you can get Zn in parafermions and more general G in more complicated models. And this symmetry uh, structure is called a Tambara-Yamagami symmetry uh, labeled Ty sub G. OK, so that was the 1 plus 1D version. And there's an analog in 3 plus 1D that let me put on the board here. So what's the analog in 3 plus 1D? So now we're going to have a theory T again. And instead of having a Zn ordinary symmetry, we'll consider an example with a Zn one-form symmetry. A one-form symmetry is generated by topological surface operators. So two space-time dimensions on these operators. And gauging produces a theory with a dual symmetry. So it's again possible to consider an example that is self-dual. And there are, there are quantum field theories like that. So we're going to focus on what's the algebraic structure of these. And I'll try to explain what's going on in this cartoon. So again, if you have a theory that's self-dual, by the, by the exact same kind of construction that I had on the previous uh, slide, we can make a duality defect D. This is a three-dimensional defect now. It cuts space-time into two pieces. And what's the kind of money fusion rule, the, the, the analog of D times D being the sum over all the group elements in 1 plus 1D? Well, it's this one, D times D dagger. The thing that you might have expected to be 1 if it were a unitary symmetry is not 1, but is instead a sum over these surface operators defining this Zn one form symmetry. So that's kind of what this picture is supposed to show. So here's, here's D and here's D dagger, and when you fuse them, you get this interesting sum over, over surfaces here. Now, this kind, of, uh, th this kind of fusion here, this kind of right-hand side is something you might call a condensation defect. It's like we're condensing this, uh, the operators defining this uh, Zn one-form symmetry, but not everywhere in space-time, just along a sublocus. And that makes a new topological defect. There's a kind of order-disorder map that's common in all of these uh, constructions. Oh, uh, -like shape. Th this here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, th this is a cartoon trying to illustrate. Uh, the, the question was, what's this sum over? Here, sigma is a three manifold, and this is a surface operator. So uh, how do I make sense of this? Well, you sum over all surfaces that are inside the three manifold where you put this, this domain wall. That's how you make sense of it. Yeah, the, the blue honeycomb thing is supposed to illustrate that 
um, uh, th th something that I wrote here but did not say, which is that you could think that D, D can act, it's codimension one, so it can act on point-like operators. But U is codimension two. It doesn't act on point-like operators. So this thing that you made on the right-hand side is transparent to point-like operators. It looks like it kind of has holes in it. You can send point-like operators through with no consequence. But if you try to send an extended operator through, like a line, then you'll see this mesh. OK, the order disorder map. Uh, so, so there's this familiar fact in uh, 1 plus 1D kramers wanye duality that if you, uh, if you act with kramers wanye duality on an order operator, it becomes a disorder operator. What's, th there's a general version of that in this 3 plus 1D case, where if we have here a uh, Wilson loop and we move this duality defect past it, it doesn't stay as a loop operator, but instead it gets dressed with a topological surface. That's this picture here. So this is a kind of higher analog of the order disorder map that one has in the 1 plus 1D Ising model. OK. So that is the kind of lightning overview of some of the developments about uh, non-invertible symmetry in uh, the last few years. And now I want to uh, kind of situate this question about anomalies in a broader uh, point of view. Let me talk about some dynamical constraints. So these are symmetries just like ordinary symmetries. These they're, they're, have a richer algebraic structure, but we still want to use them to constrain dynamics. Yes, there's a question. Maybe a quick question about the previous slide. So if the memory is sticking out, should, is that the location on the memory sticks, or can I make it arbitrary? This is topological, so it can wiggle as you like. But also the, where it intersects directly? Yeah, the whole thing is topological. Can it yeah. I can it yeah. Off. Um, OK, so we're talking about some dynamics. We'd like to study dynamics that uh, can conserve these non-invertible symmetries. So let's give one example of that, which is uh, 3 plus 1D lattice gauge theory, ZN lattice gauge theory. So uh, uh, all, all the results uh, here are, are ancient, but I'll, I'll phrase them in a way uh, where we use this symmetry. So at a special coupling, this lattice theory is invariant under gauging its electric ZN one-form symmetry. So uh, here I've drawn a phase diagram. So here's N, this vertical axis is N, N of the ZN. And here's some coupling. And this middle, uh, say, what, that I've called 2 pi, that's the special coupling where the theory is self-dual and enjoys one of these non-invertible symmetries. And the, the phase diagram is well known. So for small n, there's a first-order phase transition between a trivial vacuum and a ZN topological phase, ZN topological quantum field theory, that's down here. And for larger n, you enter a gapless window, and uh, the theory is uh, in a self-dual Coulomb phase at this special value of the coupling constant. We can nail this value of the coupling just by knowing this symmetry. In particular, uh, this symmetry, we have to find it in Maxwell theory, this Coulomb phase, and so that fixes this coupling constant. Yes, question? Um, this is between, in, in this naive, th this simple theory that I wrote down, it's between 4 and 5 at some non-integer value. Okay, uh, so that's all very well known, but how could we say it from this viewpoint uh, using these uh, non-invertible uh, symmetry? Well, we could say that the first order transition is governed by spontaneous symmetry breaking of this duality defect D. What I mean by that is that the Higgs and confining phases differ by gauging this ZN one form symmetry. So as you go to the transition point, you have two vacua of equal importance, one uh, equal energetic importance, one supports a ZN gauge theory, and the other is trivial. Those are exactly the states being related by D. Meanwhile, the vacuum in the gapless Coulomb phase at the self-dual coupling preserves the symmetry D. And that has some consequence if you were to think about, for instance, the massive particle excitations, which are up near the lattice scale. These would be in representations of this duality symmetry. So that would mean there are magnetic monopoles and charge and electrons with equal mass. That's something we conclude from this symmetry. OK, more gen so this is supposed to motivate the idea of trying to constrain uh, phases using non-invertible symmetries and trying to understand uh, familiar concepts like anomalies, how they might port over to these uh, 
to this more general algebraic setting. So we want to constrain these uh, general QFT phases with non-invertible symmetry. And beyond gapless and spontaneous symmetry breaking phases, we might also want to co contemplate symmetry preserving gapped phases. We want to understand what are the possibilities. Um, and let me highlight some kind of interesting result, uh, which I'll try to explain a little bit about later, which is that, uh, for instance, if you consider uh, 3 plus 1D duality defect with ZN1 form symmetry, there are interesting constraints on the phases that one can derive. So, for instance, you can derive that you could only have a trivially gapped phase if a certain number theoretic condition on N is true, which I'll, uh, I'll explain a little bit later. Um, and you can have a system that is a symmetry-preserving gap phase, that is, D not being spontaneously broken, if a weaker number theoretic constraint on N is true. So these are something that you might try to call anomalies of non-invertible symmetries. There's some constraints on the phases, given the algebra, some constraints on possible realizations of the symmetry. And I'd like to tell you how to derive these and other things. Any questions? Yeah? Well, I'll try to explain exactly. It's, it's a great question. The question is basically, what's the definition of an anomaly for a non-invertible symmetry? So uh, for me, an anomaly will be an obstruction to realize, any obstruction to realizing uh, non-invertible symmetry in an invertible phase, in, in a SPT. So, so there, there's a complementary definition that you might try to give, which is it's an obstruction to gauging the non-invertible symmetry. And for standard symmetries, those are the same. And Shuheng and collaborators recently pointed out that for non-invertible symmetries, these notions seem to differ. So, uh, so I will use the, the version that, has, that is helpful for kind of constraining our G-flows. Yeah? So you say you have a one-form symmetry. Um, can I think of it as a merging that I always get? Um, let's say I'm trying to construct a lattice model. Are you constraining the lattice model to have the one-form exactly? Or is it in, in the model that I was talking about, it has the one-form symmetry on the lattice. Then you'll also break this symmetry that I'm talking about. They form an algebra where one you, you can't preserve you can't preserve D without preserving the one form symmetry. Because sometimes you know the one form is more stable, right? Breaking one form symmetry yeah. is more stable. Yeah. But that does not happen here or there is there are actually analogs of that effect. Um, that uh, the question is about maybe we can defer this to, to later, but that leads to some kind of interesting patterns of, of symmetry breaking that you can consider that are very particular to non-invertible symmetries. Yeah, Ruben. I think I have some elementary confusion. May I misunderstood? So for the 3 plus 1D case, let's take Z2. Shouldn't Higgs and Confine be connected? Uh, I'm just talking about the, the no matter on the no, no charge matter, just the Z2 uh, lattice gauge theory. So then what does Higgs mean? Or you have Higgs? By, by Higgs, I mean that, sorry, I meant that there's a ZN TQFT. It looks Higgs from the point of view of the U1 phase. Yeah. OK, so anomalies and symmetry TQFTs. This is really where sort of the new work uh, begins, which I have 10 minutes to describe. OK, so, uh, so what, what are we going to do? What's the formalism? If you want to study anomalies, you need some kind of generalization of the idea of anomaly inflow, this idea of this bulk boundary correspondence. What's that generalization? Uh, that generalization for non-invertible symmetries um, has some, is, sometimes goes under the name of symmetry topological field theories. And, there's also people use various foods to revert, refer to the sandwiches. There's also quiche that has been defined in this subject, which I won't use quiche, and, and maybe even tartine. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, so anyway, a sandwich is, is good enough for me. Um, so we're, what are we doing here? We're going to geometrically decouple uh, the symmetry and the dynamics. That's what, uh, th that's what anomaly inflow does. And so we're going to try to realize our dynamical quantum field theory, the thing that we want to study, as what I'll call a sandwich of a TQFT in one higher dimension. So what's the picture? Here's the TQFT. And on, uh, we want to put it on a thin slab. Think of it on a thin slab with two boundary conditions. One side, of the bound one side will be some boundary condition x, which is like canonical and topological. You could think if this TQFT was a finite gauge theory, this would just be, say, Dirichlet boundary conditions for it, something kind of standard. And the other, si the other boundary contains the information about the dynamics. And so you think of this slab as thin, and then you get your theory that you wanted t back. And so, of course, this picture, the, the, the utility of it is this decoupling. So 
charged operators come from bulk defects that could end on this dynamical boundary, and symmetries would come from bulk uh, defects that are parallel to the dynamical boundary. So this is a kind of familiar uh, setup. Okay, so, so what's going to be an anomaly then? An anomaly is an obstruction to really realizing our theory T in an SPT phase. So that means in this picture, it's an obstruction to realizing an invertible T via this symmetry sandwich picture, by this picture of uh, TQFTs in one higher dimension. And so this, as I emphasized before, is a generalization of anomaly inflow, if you like, uh, to the situation of non-invertible symmetry. And it has the utility that the, the, it kind of automatically means that anomalies th thought of this way uh, obey matching conditions. So the, the symmetry TQFT is, in particular, topological, so nothing is flowing there. So anomalies are, are, as defined here, are automatically invariant under RG flow and continuous deformations and things like that. So they're robust quantities. So our goal now is basically just to characterize these gap boundaries of TQFTs and their interplay, so to try and unpack that sandwich picture a little more. OK, so let me do that. So I would now like to zoom in on the particular case of 1 plus 1D. I'll try to say the answer somewhat generally, and then I'll try to unpack uh, the results for the particular sort of Tambara Yamagami symmetry that comes about for self dual theories. So, what's the general statement about symmetry in 1 plus 1D allowing non invertible? And the symmetry is a fusion category. It's characterized by some fusion rules and some F symbol. That's the data that we're going to take as an input. And what's the symmetry TQFT? Well, there's a kind of canonical uh, 2 plus 1D TQFT that you can make given this information, which is this Drinfeld center. So, for instance, if this, is a, if this is something simple, then this will just be the double. Now, we're interested in studying topological boundaries, invertible boundaries eventually, invertible constructions eventually, but in particular topological. So, it's known how to think about topological boundaries of such a system. They're characterized by Lagrangians. What's a Lagrangian? Lagrangian is a maximal collection of anions, and these, which can condense on the boundary. And this, this condensation trivializes the, the dynamics. Um, so it means that th that's why this maximal uh, point comes about. So the, the ones that don't condense are all confined. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. So you can write this, such a Lagrangian as sort of a formal sum over the uh, anion labels A in this uh, 2 plus 1 dTQFT with some integer coefficients NA. And uh, these anions must have trivial mutual statistics, uh, the anions uh, in, in L. So if you, if you do braiding here, uh, you can see from this picture that if A and A prime were both in, in L, then they have to have trivial braiding. So this is what we need to know about, uh, about boundaries. They're characterized by this algebraic structure. There's more data here that I'm neglecting, but it won't be important for us. Now, we want to set up this sandwich picture. We have a TQFT. It's 2 plus 1 dTQFT. One boundary is supposed to be canonical. What's that boundary? Well, this thing always has uh, one kind of canonical boundary, which is, you might call, characterized by a so-called electric Lagrangian. It generalizes the Dirichlet boundary condition of finite gauge theory. So, for instance, you could write it this way, if you had uh, uh, an example with a, a, a gauge theory example. And for this boundary, you could think that the fusion category symmetry is fully spontaneously broken. So all the, all, you have all the charges are visible. All the, you have lots of order parameters. And if you want to make a trivial sandwich, you want to find an anomaly, what you want is that the other side looks completely magnetic relative to this uh, electric Lagrangian. So you want to find another Lagrangian, Lm, with the property that Le and Lm intersect only in the trivial line. When you can do that, then the anomaly is, is trivial. And when you cannot do that, then you have an anomaly. So an anomaly is an obstruction to the existence of this Lm of Z of A. This is kind of the main result in 1 plus 1D. And next, I'd like to explain how to unpack that. So let me tell you quickly some results in the particular case of this self-dual kind of symmetry, this Tambara Yamagami type symmetry. So I have to tell you how to construct this uh, Z of Tambara Yamagami, this, this symmetry TQFT in this case. There are three steps. 
So you begin with uh, 2 plus 1D abelian gauge theory with gauge group G. Right? Remember that this, this self-dual symmetry, it has only sort of one object beyond, the, uh, beyond these invertible standard symmetries that we need to consider, which is this self-dual thing. So we're kind of close if we start with this uh, finite abelian gauge theory. Next, we choose a Z2 anion permutation symmetry. You can think of this as going to be the duality action. And now we gauge this Z2, and that produces this uh, symmetry TQFT that we wish to study. So it's this three, simple three-step procedure. And this, uh, this, men, this, this recipe here depends on a couple choices that I've highlighted here. So you can choose the anion permutation symmetry. There may be different ones that you wish to consider. That would lead to different non-invertible symmetries. And you all can also, um, uh, you can also add to this uh, construction a Z2 SPT before you gauge. This is called a frobenius sure indicator. That's labeled by whatever labels these Z2 SPTs. In this case, it's just a sign, a plus or minus one. So it shows up in this crossing formula here. OK, now there are two levels of obstructions. So the first is that uh, in G gauge theory, so these, I'm calculating the anomalies now, there must exist a Z2 invariant magnetic Lagrangian. This is what ensures that there is a duality invariant GSPT. So for example, if G is Zn, the anions are generated by some electric and magnetic charges. They look like e to the p, m to the q for p and some p and q. So what are the interesting Lagrangians? Here's the electric one, just the, just the electric particles. And here's the only magnetic one that you can find. And so they have trivial intersection. But you can see that if, you, if your Z2 symmetry that you're interested in is the electric magnetic duality which exchanges E and M, then clearly LM is not duality invariant. So that tells you that already that there is, so there is no duality invariant magnetic Lagrangian subgroup. So this Tambara Yamagami with, uh, for group Zn is anomalous. You could think of this as like symmetry enforced gaplessness. It's generalizing a, a fact about the critical Ising model that we're familiar with, which is that uh, the, if you want to have, uh, the, if you want to preserve the kramer zwanier duality as a symmetry, as something that, that, uh, that's a symmetry of the vacuum, then you have to be at the gapless point, at the critical temperature. Um, and that, that's, that's what this statement tells us for Z2. We can move away from the critical temperature at the expense of spontaneously breaking that symmetry. That statement is true for the Zn analog as well. If you do Zn times Zn, now, uh, now the story is, say, richer. You would get n to the fourth anions. They have some... Uh, two species of electric charges, two species of magnetic charges. And then, uh, depending on your choice of which duality you might study, you may or may not find a duality invariant Lagrangian. So, for instance, if you have this duality that just exchanges them, then you find that uh, a magnetic Lagrangian exists if n is so-called Pythagorean. So I said that condition before. Let me tell you what it really is. It means that the number n admits a factorization like this, it's 2 to the either 0 or 1 times a product of odd primes, each of which is 1 mod 4. Um, so that, that's a kind of level of sophistication that I think is above the level of sophistication that you might encounter for ordinary anomalies of invertible symmetries. This kind of, I never saw uh, an anomaly that had such an such a intricate classification before. By contrast, if you pick a different uh, duality action, um, kind of off-diagonal, then Lm exists for any n. OK, the final thing I want to say about this example is that, so OK, let's stick, stick in the Zn times Zn. I told you about sort of a first level obstruction, but there's something next. What about this frobenius sure indicator, the crossing relation on the duality defects? How does that enter the story? So you can use the fusion rule and Lagrangian conditions to show that uh, any Lagrangian for this, any magnetic Lagrangian, must contain a duality anion. Now, I told you that everything that is in a uh, magnetic Lagrangian has to have trivial uh, mutual statistics. In particular, it has to be a boson. Can can't condense something other than a boson. And so uh, we'll have an anomaly unless we can find a duality anion that's bosonic. And that's something we can compute. We can check the spins of the duality anions. 
Um, so here's a little table of different, uh, different cases with different, uh, this is telling you the number of bosonic duality anions. And so you see that for some choices of n and some crossing, uh, some kind of F symbol or Frobenius sure indicator omega, which is valued in plus or minus one, there are no duality anions. And so that means that these examples are also anomalous. So this is kind of an anomalous F symbol for, the, uh, for this fusion category symmetry. Okay, so I was going to tell you about 3 plus 1D, but I will skip it. I'll put these slides on the board so people can pause them online. Let me jump right to the conclusions. So non-invertible symmetries with uh, anomalies occur in many examples, but they're a level of sophistication beyond what we're used to. Now, one reason for that is, is that the structure of non the mathematical structure of, of these obstructions, I think, is, is a bit unclear in the sense that um, if we have standard symmetry, standard invertible symmetries, and we think about anomalies for them, then they have a nice stacking operation. They form a group. Right? SPT phases form a group. Uh, we can say when we have a trivial uh, F symbol, for instance, very naturally. And we don't have, we don't have that, uh, that kind of structure, apparently, when we talk about these non-invertible symmetries and their anomalies. So it's harder to characterize what is the structure going on there. Um, future topics that I think are interesting. So one uh, came up in, in questions, which is, what does the thing that I just defined have to do with gauging? Usually, in the kind of old school presentation of anomalies, we thought that they were obstructions to gauging, and then we happily discovered that they had some, prop some matching properties along renormalization group flow. Here, I've turned it around. I said, the thing I really want is the thing that has matching properties for RG flows. And maybe it has nothing to do with gauging. Maybe it does. But at least in, in some examples, you can see that these notions are different. So we don't really know uh, uh, what the relationship is here. And let me just uh, highlight that I think it's interesting to study these kind of questions in more detail on the lattice. Um, there's been some recent interesting work by uh, Shuheng and uh, Seiberg about that, um, showing that in, on, in lattice models, for instance, these algebras are, uh, often include lattice translations. And so there's kind of an interesting LSM kind of feel to uh, to uh, the story there. And it would be interesting to bring some of these uh, examples into that situation as well. So let me stop here and take some more questions. Thank you. We have time for maybe a quick question if there is. OK. Sorry, just a quick comment. Um, just a subtlety is that the live stream and recording uh, cuts off right at noon. Maybe Tim can already set up um, yeah. Yeah. for the next one. Uh, just terminology. Why, why did you say, um, like in the Eisen model, when you break the thing, it's like spontaneously broken? Because I would imagine, like, you tune the temperature to, it's like explicitly breaking. Maybe, oh, oh, no, no. I meant at the sorry, at the first order transition. I was talking about uh, maybe I answered something incorrectly, but I was talking about the first order transition in say the lattice example. At that point, there are two ground states of equal importance one of which supports a ZN gauge theory, and the other is completely trivial. And those are the two states that are being exchanged by D. That's, so that, when I, my point was that the, the, the ground state, the natural ground state, is not, uh, they're not invariant under the action of D. That's the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, thank you, Clay.